Hello everyone, today we talk about Arabs versus Franks uh, in a scattered um, consideration on the mostly the, the Carolingian perspective of the of the story, which is most of the times the uh, not just the most uh, known in general um, in popular culture, but properly what was created on purpose from an ideological point of view uh, since the very first clashes uh, with the Muslim invaders. This is extremely important from an historical point of view because it tells you so much about Francia at the time. And um, you know that in Western historiography the idea of, I don't know, the Battle of Tours slash Poitiers um, in 732 the answering campaigns in uh, across the Pyrenees led by Charlemagne, right? All all the myth properly of 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 the of the warriors of of, of fate at this point in a almost pre crusader mentality, which is very important, right? It, it, it's it's an idea that uh, flowed relatively easily and for for understandable reasons in our in our common feeling. Right, especially as Europeans, it's say as continental Europeans, Western Europeans, we perceive that while also, you know, mostly ignoring other other events such as, you know, the siege of Constantinople, basically at the beginning of, of the eighth century, the Battle of Acroinus, that possibly had uh, comparable with mm, with Tour, right, and uh, and other situations that we try to 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 expand in critically with some videos also about the Saracens. Today we will talk about them uh, in part relatively to the Frankish fort in Italy. Um, but uh, it's uh, strangely enough a topic that we didn't dedicate uh, enormous space to. We, we discussed this, we made a video on properly the Umayyad invasion of the West. Um, if you search for it, it's literally the title. Uh, we talked about uh, in fact, the Saracens, as we were saying before, but th there is um, really an enormous cultural legacy deriving properly from the construction of the idea of the Arab of Spain, right? A true, uh, the uh, the ideal, right? The Carolingian ideal right? that that remains throughout all the eighth century, especially um, the model. You see, the Arab at the more as the the enemy par excellence of the Franks, so much that even the Saxons and the Vikings were depicted by the Franks with the typical features of the Saracens at the time. And this tells you, importantly, how how f deeply felt in this um, reality the, the religious dimension was, right? Uh, un unlike what happened actually with, with this with, with the Moors, with the Saracens, uh, with, the, with, with the Saxons, with the Vikings, that Especially to say, well, of course, the the the, the caliphate of Cordoba eventually has it, it autonomized itself from from uh, from from Syria, from Damascus, from the Mayas proper. Felt this quite deeply, but was framed in a reality that definitely f um, had tried to to expand further north, as as we uh, we know, the same Battle of Poitiers, but it was fundamentally confined to the Iberian Peninsula. That in many ways, it's like a world on its own. It's almost an empire on its own. But for every ruler that tried to extend its control over the, this world, this enormous um, territory, consider that France is the largest, yes, in Europe. But Spain is already pretty big. And Spain plus Portugal um, are more extended than, than France itself. And also more di more diverse, uh, importantly enough. Uh, here we can't digress on any single background because it would be very fascinating. In fact, I hope to talk much more about uh, early medieval Spain and early medieval France because that or Gaul, let's say better, because of the composition, the composite nature. There was nothing like uh, Frankish Gaul, right? There were other peoples. There were the Aquitanians. We will discuss today. There were the the Burgundians still. The Bretons, for example, that we know how history went, right? But it's very meaningful to observe how essentially the southwestern frontier of the Carolingian Empire wasn't even the hottest properly in terms of uh, what would happen uh, just by scale of uh, territorial acquisitions, for example, with Germany and Italy. 
uh, or for what would happen during the second invasions. Um, yes, the Saracens hit hard Carolingian Italy, um, and surely also Southern Gaul, but there was another, you know, the, 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 the Frankish regions of Southern Gaul was always problematic, to, to say the least. Um, then the Vikings hit much harder Gaul specifically, the 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 Angers, Germany mostly, but let's say uh, still the the religious struggle prevailed as a narrative um, it, from properly in this example provided by the what is improperly definable as the Arab versus Frankish, um, in fact, confrontation in the story because uh, there wasn't, as we will see properly, as we. Uh, we will try to explain properly nothing like like a properly Arab Frankish struggle, right? There were lots of different players that were often fighting, um, regardless of like it it happens in any context basically of, of religious um, belief that, however, used for political reasons, religion uh, to do a lot of things, not 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 just for the war in itself but also for presenting themselves in the international arena in a way or another. Um, and I guess that the Battle of Poitiers in this sense is, is a very misunderstood battle, not much because of the usual debate or of uh, how important it was, did it actually stop the Islamic invasions, or was it, you know, or was it just a minor struggle? It, the, the truth there lays fundamentally in, in, in the between. Right. Also because we don't know much about it in the first place. But what is dramatically overlooked and that we tend to misunderstand is that that wasn't a battle for France or for, uh, for Spain. Uh, that was a battle for Aquitaine. That was another country. That is, the Franks had nothing to do with it. Um, the, the Spanish had nothing to do with it. And still, it was a very important uh, chunk of Europe with a very specific ethnic, uh, say, it's just from a cultural point of view, and also its urbanization, its wealth, its mm, exposition, both to, to the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, etc., a very particular reality that, in fact, would survive a bit on its own historically. Also, if you look at, during the, the, the full Middle Ages, Aquitaine was, was literally another country from France. Right Today, we speak of France because the, the modern and eventually contemporary state swallowed, like in Europe, basically in every country did, like other nations. Let's say it was like Francia here was just a portion of Gaul uh, and extending also in, outside of Gaul at some level, in Germany, for example, in Australia, from which the St. Carolingians came from, by the way. Then there were these other chunks, right? The, 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 we have seen Alamannia in other places. That was properly Germany in, uh, historically, like, but still, you know, today's France has swallowed Als Alsace, right? You know, that is, was historically German. Um, Aquitaine, Burgundy, right? These were other countries with other people, with, diff with a different language, right? Um, the same goes for, you know, for other, for other states. The same Spain today is a, is, a, is a set of nations, historically. The same goes with Germany, with, with the United Kingdom, with Italy. So all the major Western European countries are fundamentally the product that historical, but that doesn't mean we have to blame or to to idealize whatever. Frankly, historically speaking, it's a pointless exercise for my interests and my time. Um, but uh, it's much more interesting to see how things happen. But the struggle between the Arabs and the Franks took on this ideological character because of this that specific imperialistic role that both the Carolingians and the uh, here still formerly the Umayyads, rather, you know, the, the Umayyad governors of, of uh, Al-Andalus, and eventually what would become the Caliphate of Cordoba as a thing on its own, were using to properly to just, I don't know, like the Byzantine Empire, to, to claim their uh, universal ecumenic power, right? And this is a, yet a, 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 another topic that we can't sum up here. But it's also very interesting to compare. We made, I think, a couple of videos uh, comparing a bit the uh, Christian Muslim ecumenic ideologies, also the, you know, how the, this developed specifically in the Latin Germanic world with the Carolingian Empire, what, what was like in the Greek Orthodox one, uh, with the Byzantines. But there were also other realities. I don't know. The same Anglo Saxons, as we know, had an imperial 
realistic mindset properly uh, since the very beginning, since they, they set foot uh, in Britain. Um, the same goes with Spain, right? That's an empire properly, was conceived as such. Uh, the fact that eventually just the, what from Charlemagne's time would, would evolve into the, the Holy Roman Empire was, was like the, the prevalent one, was, was considered the empire, but we mostly think of it in the in a nation, modern nationalistic sense that of course doesn't have anything to do with any historical reality um, the empire at the time was conceived truly universally which means that it was something that popped up uh, wherever God basically decided to tribe it it's uh, you know the glory you know to, to provide with glory and power and actual in fact faculty of command over over the world right and you realize in that in a continent where you have at least three of these things, you have the Carolingian Empire, you have the Caliphate of Cordoba, you have the Byzantine Empire. Well, that's and that for not talking about other surrounding realities as well uh, that were in very deep contact with each other. Right? Notoriously, Charlemagne was allied with the Caliph of Baghdad in an anti-Byzantine faction, for example. Um, so you understand that also religion has very few to do. With uh, with lots of things, albeit it's, it has to do basically with everything in this regard, uh, too. And in ways that we can't properly just analyze from an ideological standpoint. Um, but what starts with the uh, Arab and Berber, by the way, occupation of Spain and the subjugation of the Visigoths to the Saracens, except for this narrow um, band stripe of resistance in the quasi inaccessible Asturias in the north also in a dimension that yes it took these Visigothic refugees and whatever but even in there eventually their conquista would restart not with a national Visigothic feeling rather of a Christian religious one right the Asturias were basically a Celtic country. They had not much to do with the Visigoths. They had always fought against them. There was no way to subdue them. Uh, there were some of the least, if not basically non-Roman, de facto never Romanized areas of the same empire. Because there wasn't much, right? You know, it was uh, they were um, underdeveloped areas, etc. But still, they they managed to, to compromise eventually the unity um, of the, as they had already done under Visigothic times at some point, of the the plenitude of the Iberian Empire. And eventually, you know, the tides turned, importantly also with the same Frankish support. Um, and that's where the game starts being fascinating, because you realize it was a degree of permeability, of course, uh, along this huge frontier um, that stretches fundamentally from the northern mountains up to in the east to the, the, the Pyrenees, and eventually with the same Aquitaine, but also with, with the Ebro Valley, the northeastern, uh, same Islamic uh, powers that, however, were something on its on their own, because the Ebro Valley just, you know, even in here, it was another another place, right? It's a bit this, the rivalry between Castilla and Aragon later on. Like even in Visigothic times, the, the cities of the Ebro Valley were essentially Mediterranean, strongly Romanized. Think about Barcelona, Saragossa, and all these centers. Didn't like continental mm, Spain, uh, where the Visigoths later, the, 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 at this point, uh, in fact, the, the, the Moors, eventually the Castilians, would mm, essentially hinge, incentrate their, their power, their, their power base, right? So there was always like uh, a problem of keeping these things united and they fought right irregardless of religion right El Cid the hero of the Reconquista he fought regularly also for Muslims against Christians uh, the, you know it, Christians and Muslims were always allied somewhere at some point as much as they fought against each other the, the Saracen base of Fraxinetum in Provence that terrorized uh, Piedmont and the upper Rhine Valley and southern France it stayed there just because it was needed right in the diplomatic balance between the Ottonians and the Caliphate of Cordoba and even the same southern uh, Gallic cities that were marching to trade that the Saracens opened with all, all along the, the Mediterranean up to, to Far East Asia um, were actually fine with Saracen presence much more than they were with Frankish presence from the north, which was less, you know, um, 
provided them with less opportunities at some level. So uh, that's the frame that we already traced um, in other videos. Uh, but it's fundamental just to orientate yourself in this historical thing because otherwise it doesn't make any, any other interpretation based on merely on a kind of a counterposition between two blo doesn't exist, right? Just no, historiographically speaking, I think nobody, not even in the times when this was actually written in, in a, in a ideologicized kind of religious nationalistic sense was, was never quite that, right? And this is fascinating even to study from, from the sources because not even uh, Car the Carolingian sources, except some ecclesiastical one, basically telling us the story of what happened in the first half of uh, during the 8th century, let's say, actually shows uh, a dichotomic uh, opposition between the two sides. Um, that that listening to the sources is very important, uh, but also very, very rare, let's say, to, for somebody to do. Um, so, what is also clamorous, but explainable in this sense, is the, the success of Islamic invasions altogether. I mean, these people created, in the blink of an eye, right, an, an, an empire that stretched from, from India to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the same conquest of Spain had taken literally just three years from 711 to 714, right? The reasons here, also we can't digress, we will make a video about this, but substantially it doesn't speak much in favor of the solidity of the Visigothic Kingdom. That was evolving in a very interesting way, but also in a pretty, um, you know, uh, in something that was starting to find a, a, a more fixed order, but there was still very private nature with a weak central authority and with a lot of troubles and also press communities that, in fact, namely especially the, the Jewish ones, uh, were, were quite consistent, you know, support also the, um, the, the, the Islamic invasion, but this happened where, you know, the, the same Visigothic nobility that in part stood aside uh, and had something to gain from the centralization in this enormous land. Right, that is also very difficult to control. Gaul, in many ways, is easy to control historically. Right, it has this great Atlantic plains dotted with very specific centers that dominate the countryside, well connected by Roman road, and important demographic and economic resources in a fundamentally flattened society where everybody is a servant. There are just a, a few, but very powerful magnates. So, once you knock out the main centers of resistance, you can't control it very easily. Right, this this happened all the time uh, in in history. Not because it, we don't have to think of foreign invasion, but literally from the local government also capability of control. But even just I don't know. Look at how the Nazis stayed in France. They basically spent vacations in there for years uh, before 1944. Um, and um, Spain is completely different. Spain is a li it, it, it's a nightmare. Right for any army that you can imagine, historically speaking, this land is is a freaking mess. Right, uh, it has a, a, a terrible ground, a terrible weather. Um, it's very difficult to control. Um, it's uh, it, it doesn't ha it, it it lacks. You see, it, it's unitary in its in its fragmentation. Right in an area that that it, it's not m completely coherently uh, even traceable in terms of the, the belonging of its communities or the, the, the arrangement, but still that uh, was, in fact, you know, look at what even historically after Las Navas the Spanish kingdoms did. Like, it basically had the opportunity there to knock out the, the Moors, right? It took other 200 years to do it, right? Of, of course, in Granada the, 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 the Muslims were well entrenched. They even re received support, say, from the Genoese for uh, for financial interests with the competing against the competing arrogant, um, but the truth being is that the major Sp Iberian monarchies uh, spent 200 years essentially fighting each other for the for yeah the the the, the hegemony over the peninsula and the Muslims remained there for all, uh, still that time even though the Christians had gotten the upper hand, um, so. This brings us, however, to today's topic because, you know, the Muslims think here of how they had 
properly seen their victories historically. That, that's not, um, it's not important that many of, of these invaders were not actually Arab, but they were actually Berbers. They were not African troops. They were Levi. They also were very different in the military custom in part from from the Arab, were not properly Arabized elites, by the way. But still, they thought were participating to this major tide, unstoppable invasion, driven by God, of course, and that had conquered basically the entire known world, and now was entering, and it is some of the most, you know, had conquered some of the single most advanced areas in the globe at that time. Uh, the, even after Poitiers and the, or the, the Battle of Talas River, etc., the, the fragmentation of the Caliphate, the Islamic civilization would enter one of the greatest phases of productivity and creativity um, and development, etc. So these people were pro- and they wouldn't even properly realize that yet, because we're talking still about the early 8th century. Think about this. Like, the Western Roman Empire had fallen not even to centers in a half before. Um, it, it's, it's such an archaic and primitive world that we don't even imagine. Also because, as we were saying before, we don't even have much sources about this. But the idea was still that these guys had, you know, got from their side. They had conquered everybody. They were just entering without, without any fear. Right? They, they, they cross the Gibraltar Strait. They, they make the Visigothic Kingdom collapse like that, um, they, what do they do? They cross the Pyrenees, right? The reasons why they cross the Pyrenees, um, far from, you know, even having an idea of what Europe was concretely and which people inhabited them from, a, you know, for the sake of a concrete political and strategical assessment. And of course, without any, without any capacity to invade Europe as such, um, was um, to seize um, an area that was definitely dramatically advanced, right? That part of Gaul that had belonged historically to the Visigothic kingdom. We're not talking about Aquitaine properly meant, but rather um, the um, the southern Gaul properly, the, the, the Mediterranean watershed of it. We'll talk about Aquitaine, what it means properly in a while. Um, Narbonne, right, there was this, essentially this stripe of called Septimania, it was called like that because allegedly it took seven days to cross it. Um, this Mediterranean coastline uh, in the south, uh, it's today's languedoc Roussillon in, you know, the, the uh, um, they, um, they uh, were fundamentally some of the single most Romanized areas of Europe. Um, had remained, as we've seen also, well, a bit like the Ebro Valley, very well, um, you know, urbanized, connected with Mediterranean traffic. There were fertile areas, well connected between the Mediterranean and Central Europe. I mean, these were uh, a very important prize, right, too, for, for the Muslims to seize. And in fact, Narbonne was um, occupied in 718, Nîmes and Carcassonne in 725, right, in already. Since 721, the Arabs had presented themselves in front of Toulouse and Provence, together with the wall Rhone Basin, had become theater of their deeds. Let's call them this way. So you can imagine it was mostly raiding activities, but not only, because once you occupy a place, establish, you, you want it to, to be, you know, uh, functioning. Um, the problem, though, is that you so, so first of all, why did the Arabs invade, especially those areas? Also, that there was these were areas where the the Visigoths had taken refuge in part, right? Because you know that the Franks had basically knocked out the the Visigoths from Aquitaine. We made videos about this, week about the Battle of Vouillé, um and uh, the literally the loss of Atlantic Aquitaine to the not properly to Frankish domination, as you'll see in a while, and definitely so after the fragmentation of the Norwegian monarchy since the, the very early, like starting even from the 6th century, and definitely by the 7th, um, uh, after Dagobert especially. Um, the, um, so to, to, to the Franks, the, the Atlantic watershed was in, in the this, this sphere, and, and it was also a very different one. 
right? Because we mostly say, uh, we talk about Aquitaine as it was a unitary uh, reality. This, this is not entirely true. Um, uh, historically, Aquitaine, even if you read Caesar, you know that that was habitated by the Aquitanians. It was habitated by peoples that were more akin to the ones of, like, the Basques, North Eastern Iberian Peninsula. They weren't properly Celtic. They were Celticized at some point, right? But the, 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 the central stripe, what was called properly Gaul, the other one was Belgica. Um, so Gaul was always ethnically very, very, you know, so that's, that's overlooked, composed by a certain standard was another thing, especially south of the uh, Garonne, but not all, even up to up to the Loire, mm. so also where Poitiers to are, as, as, as a frontier area, uh, are decisively less urbanized and developed than properly what was um, the Gallia Narbonensis in pre-Diocletianian times. That is to say, in fact, the, the Mediterranean watershed of what would be called for administrative reasons as a wall, Aquitaine, up to the Loire in the north. And in fact, the Franks had kicked out the Visigoths out of Aquitaine, but they didn't have out of, of, of this um, southern stripe. It was dramatically rich, right? And, uh, and evolved. So basically, it was always a frontier area, but the Visigoths had historically retained this area, which means, as we've seen, that it's not that the Visigoths from, from the, uh, the central Iberian plateau would actually manage to control it, but it, was, it, it fell, namely, formally, within the same Visigothic kingdom. So, there was some important cultural uh, affinity. You know that Aquitaine, also up to the, the, the 11th century, it, it included Auvergne, um, uh, so also, as we've seen, Provence, um, these other areas of also southern, southwestern uh, France proper, were very much Visigothic. I don't know if you've ever visited that uh, historical region in Europe, but you can breathe another air. If you, if you have visited the north of France, Valerie, you know, it's another country, fundamentally. It's, uh, it's Occitania, right, proper. And this, this area was of dramatic cultural importance, for medieval civilization, because the influxes that eventually arrived via Spain with, with the Arabs, with important centers also probably have had been Rom Romanity, refueled with this uh, renewed Greek, um, Persian, even Indian knowledge and this philosophy, these, these books, etc., are a bit excluded by our popular view of the Middle Ages, which is styled roughly around 15th century England, right? These areas were also dramatically advanced, right? That's where the Caliphate of Cordoba could exist in the first place as a state, which the only state that existed in Europe at the time was the Byzantine Empire, right? Latin Germanic Europe, as we'll see, would also take the upper hand, it was something, but it took much more time to, 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 to get started proper, right? And with the Battle of, of, of Tour, we, we see that first important step, right? I never downsized or downplayed the importance of the Battle of Tours. It's just it has to be properly contextualized because otherwise it becomes just, oh, see, you see, Schwarzkopf said it was important, so it's it's the version that, yeah, we, we kicked the Muslims out, yeah, and no, it, it's not really like that, right? It, that, first of all, didn't happen. Um, and secondly, it's it, the importance is, is far beyond the, this kind of, you know, jokes. Um, the... Um, the idea was that Aquitaine, however, now was, was controlled by properly uh, these dukes that, uh, you know, we're talking about Odo of Aquitaine, Eud of, of Aquitaine, if you prefer, um, who was a powerful prince, but became insane because of, of the capacity that he had had in this early 8th century, where, you know, in 725 or 731, even, you know, cities like Autun had been set on fire, been destroyed. So that was a frontier area. The Arabs were causing damage, right? But it was like part of how war was led at the time. It may scorched her strategy in the face of, you know, in, in a frontier area to, 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 to reduce the, the economical capacity of, of the enemy. Well, you know, the demographic ones as well. You know, it was an important thing. So that's also why it's, it's an area that eventually 
you know, uh, properly didn't see a center of power in spite of its advantages because there were other realities that bordered it, that kind of prevented it in part. But still, Aquitaine, with center of Toulouse especially, uh, as the most important city, was um, defended in this first, uh, you know, in this early 8th century by Otto of Aquitaine that won an important victory against the same uh, Muslims. But he also kept the Franks out, right? The Aquitanians wanted to be out. There, there was nothing, as we were seeing there, as, you know, ah, the Aquitanians, they are just Christians fighting against the Muslims. But no, they, they were actually much more concerned and legitimately more concerned by the Franks. Also because they stood just across the Loire River, that is next door, um, and their power is mounting with the rise of this of these new dynasty of uh, of Pippin is Arnold things led at this time by Charles um, that has coming from Australia, so it's a completely different world, even from the Neustria that bordered Tours, so even more distant from Aquitaine from a mental point of view, that is um that is reconsolidating its power, it's fueling it's rebuilding its um clientels and that is becoming a, th a very important thorn in the side um for um for for the for the aquitanians that are trying by the way to 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 annoy the carolingians by uh with infiltrating in burgundy uh backing their elites reviving revolting against the franks right so creating a situation that was very um, problematic with kind of equilibristic for the aquitanians and and also dangerous for the same Franks that up to that point had had an important faced an important crisis like the the rise of these uh, major domes of palace of Austrasia to to power had occurred in a situation where the empire was still you know the the the, the Merovingian because this is technically there are still Merovingian uh, dynasts formally in charge right but de facto the the the, the government is is taken and you know, carried out by the Carolingians already, but still in a fragmented situation, if you look at on a map, Aquitaine is freaking huge, right, to the Carolingians, they had in the east the Saxons that kept harassing their frontier, then the, there were still peoples like the Frisians or the Bretons, and the Burgundian and Alemannic uh, aristocracies were a bit, weren't uh, unloyal, right, and um, so it was basically about Francia proper still, Neustria and Austrasia as a center of power. And this was, you know, an important one, a powerful one, a well-structured one, definitely, that that properly allowed the same rise of the Carolingians themselves, who were definitely very clever, very shrewd, very capable. But um, the, uh, the games were not made already, right? There was nothing deterministic about the rise of this Carolingian power. Um, so the um, the the, the uh, see the the Emir Abd Ar Rahman um, Al Ghafiqi was basically the newly appointed uh, uh, government of Al Andalus on behalf of the Umayyads of Damascus. That still had there was an important connection between the two. Don't think that were right. Um, so say distant therefore not influential no there is spain received even if you look at the military uh technology and equipment i mean we find stuff that you could find in central asia that had from persia from from that had arrived to from the middle east through muslim the muslim elites in mediterranean into spain to caliphate of course it was this huge basin of demographics and economics it was however concentrated in the south in the batica in the al andalus of the Iberian Peninsula, hence the difficulties to control the north. But so important was that stripe of land in southern Gaul and the connection also with the Ebro Valley in the center of the, the, the Mediterranean coastline, etc., that, you know, that would be the normal strategic goal for the Arabs that weren't so concerned about, you know, the Asturias because they had, first of all, basically subjugated them already, namely, they couldn't control the airs. These guys went on with guerrillas, with raids, but there were small powers, right? Um, Aquitaine was far more threatening because it was essentially playing on those powers in the south of the Pyrenees, Muslim powers now, uh, but still basically ruling Christian, uh, sometimes barely Christian, actually, in the north of Spain by the beginning of the 8th century, but still, you know, fundamentally from Yarsa. 
communities that were more than happy actually to participate to these raids into foreign land, given that their new rulers were strong enough to, to, to afford that. Um, and that were definitely cooperating, as we know, with the Muslims very often. Uh, and uh, for their own interests, because once again, it's obvious that a city... Uh, you know, an important Roman city of northeastern Spain would have a lot of interest from guys that control it in a civilized way. There weren't, you know, Muslim control over, you know, these areas wasn't, it, it's not because it, it wasn't oppressive because, you know, all, all go, every single government at the time was oppressive, right? Look at what the Franks did to their peasants or whatever, you know, they, it, it was the normality of social segmentation. But in a urbanized, rich, demographic context, well-connected with trade, whatever, civilized rulers would rule in a civilized way. Um, and that's why it was so easy for, for the Muslims to install themselves, right? They had troubles to, to keep things together at the beginning because it was a new rule, new place. They had a demographic uh, disadvantage. They basically started to rule with the local elites, as it's always. But the, the Islamic invasions were possible because the the peoples let themselves being conquered to be under their rule rather than under the Byzantines, under the Visigoths, under other... It, this is always the same story, right? Always the same one. There, there is no way in these pre-industrial realities to come there, but not even in, in today's ones, to, to come there and say, okay, now I rule, you change all religion, which didn't happen, by the way. And uh, we are the new oppressors. Ha ha, now, you know, we can't rape your, your daughters and squeeze your, you know, your, your pockets, whatever. No. Uh, this happened just because the local elites said, okay, these are actually much more profitable clientels to fit in. They're connected with a monstrous trade uh, scale. Um, we can fundamentally profit even from the new, you know, change in... Uh, of, you know, in government, we can't see what the, how the thing happened. Eventually, you know, trying to, to squeeze out whatever the thing went on. Right? This is notorious. We have Christian sources speaking of uh, Christian Mozart sources. So Christian sources under the, the Moors that, as chroniclers, were talking about the invasion, the the here the the, the Arab invasion of Aquitaine in, in positive terms. They used to say, "Ah, oh, we we scored that." Right, it, that that's the truth. I don't want to downsize even in here the atrocious violences that were committed throughout all these political upheavals. But what I would like to to point out is that they were carried out for logics that weren't about what what religion you could uh, profess or not. Because by the way, you just had to pay a tax if you were Christian. If you you know some others simply converted to to Islam just to. To, to, especially the elites that ruled to, to fit into the in, in the new statal careers, right? Uh, and or to maintain the power that had they had always had, right? And share the benefits of all the profits of all this, um, etc. Et right? So uh, Aquitaine here was playing a bit. You know, it was the main the, the main Christian power. Uh, in, in the south of Spain, uh, of Gaul, excuse me, and and it could basically interfere with northeastern Spain, that as we've seen was um, this advanced areas, very similar to Aquitaine in certain regards, at least, well connected, urbanized, whatever, to essentially ex project their own power, right on these Muslim-held uh, yet decentralized territories at the detriment of the caliphate, of what would become at least, you know, this this time was still Andalus in a Umayyad, as an Umayyad province, right? Naturally, it was risky in the sense that they all, they, all, they wanted to both conquer each other at some level. The Aquitanians didn't didn't have the the same power of, of the Arabs at this point. Spain was, in the, the, the Muslim um, bases of uh, Iberian power were, were much stronger than the Aquitanian ones, that they could li literally carry out this imperialistic... But think about the capacity of projection, right? An army that's from southern Spain man manages to launch successful invasions of southern Gaul. Uh, it's not a few, right? So much that, as we were saying before, um, part of the reason to, for which Abd al-Rahman al-Ghafiqi, 
um, obtained this big hit right in in Africa and we'll see with was not just connected with the broader you know imperialistic mindset that Islam had gained and this enormous self confidence that say you know we have conquered the world world who are these barbarians now in this place right they, they wouldn't even understand what Christianity by Western European standards was because you know the, the Christianity they had meant in the Byzantine world it was something completely different from, from this right the the Western Europe was still something you know in between and especially actually in, in, in places like Gaul or Spain, despite they, they you know paraded their own Christianity, it was often much more syncretistic. In 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 the in the case of the Franks especially with pagan and especially the military mindset that you know what was evident. So but properly they were attempted to also to tame this rebel Muslim frontier um lords that they had been settled there uh and that now were double crossing with the Aquitaine. But Abd al Rahman here had a responsibility as a leader of 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 uh of Mayat Spain, pro- properly wage war into we could see we could say the heart of Europe in a sense, but not it's not it's misleading as an idea because this was still considered by them just like an outskirt of their own empire, right? Of the Dar al Islam. Um, and they, however, crossed into Aquitaine through Gascony. That was also actually um, controlled by Aquitaine, the Aquitanians. The Aquitanians literally had in, in the north of Spain some some foothold, right? Like the area of Navarre, etc. That's how powerful Otto, especially, had had been to consolidate his his power to create all these layers of frontier, so to secure the the Aquitanian interland around manifesting his own power so here in Gascon he, he managed to defeat Odo right the I mean uh, we're talking about Abd al-Rahman defeated Odo that we don't know what strategically was thinking at that point he probably he had not much of an option he many of his cities had already been overrun but his massive uh, expedition we, we think about 20 25 thousand men right so that was the the, the Islamic army at the battle of the campaign of Poitiers. Um, and there were other armies that were harassing Burgundy, the Rhone Valley, at the same time, probably to distract the Carolingians, to say, where do we have to, you know, oblige them to split forces. Um, and uh, although perhaps uh, thought of, uh, of his early victory, we don't know, he decided to give ba- uh, to to give battle to the to the Muslims in open ground, and he he was defeated, right? At this point, uh, Bordeaux was uh, sacked. Um, It was the main city, basically, in in the area. Uh, And the Muslims marched on Tours. Why Tours? It was an important center because it was, you know, uh, basically on the Loire frontier. Um, It was essentially the the, the northernmost... um, terms of important scale important center of Aquitaine um, it tr- literally meant to arrive to, to an important frontier that had been for example the, the Franks had secured only recently the Breton mark um, it was still an area in which probably they could play uh, a bit um, and but more importantly and that's the mindset of a uh, you know, uh, Islamic ruler at the time Tour was notoriously the Frankish national sanctuary, the sepulcher of the Taumaturg Martin, Saint Martin of Tours. Right, so basically, the symbol of Gaul, right, in a unitary sense. Right, Saint Martin had, but just for the Franks, he had uh, gained this this enormous, enormous uh, prestige. As a, this was yes, also fruit of the of the Frankish elites historically since Merovingian times to, to gather around the symbols to the sense of unity of their dynasty, which was something completely different from what Franks had have you know, from what Germanic peoples had ever seen because it was completely unknown to their minds. The, the Merovingians had established what now even the Carolingians who were de facto in power wouldn't oust because it was literally about the blood. 
right? The Franks were obsessed with blood. They were so-called hematophiliac in their in their political ideology, in their ecclesiastical policy. They overly emphasized the passion, um, the, 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 the the blood, the the, the the sufferings of the flesh. This was typical so in, among other Germanic peoples that had to reconcile their essentially tribal military um, uh, you know, belief with with a religion, a peaceful religion, fundamentally, and that so in in the passion, in the sacrifice, in in the in the warrior saint as Martin had been, but not in the way eventually was uh, conceived, uh, in, you know, in popular in many other. Well, this happened also in the in Orthodox Christianity a lot, a bit. Um, military saints are basically all saints that refuse. To fight, be, become fighters. But we've also seen how in in their in the in the folklore. But we've seen how also properly their resistance had nothing to do with the renounce to to the use of violence, but rather to the, the rejection towards pagans as a you know uh, pagan sacrifice, which was a completely different uh, thing. So by seizing tour, right, um, Abdurrahman would have showed how Islam was triumphant over these this um, essentially Latin, German, Gallo-Roman uh, Frankish populations that we can't imagine what, what Gaul was at the beginning of the 8th century right? so we can't think that they would convert to Islam but let's say their, their beliefs were so you know primitive, archaic still kind of pagan-like that you know for them to see the sanctuary of Tour falling in the hands of of the infidels would would, would have been let's say oh my god these guys would, would, weren't properly even considered as infidels like what the hell knew what these guys were at the time but there was something great that had conquered they knew that the whole world that they were rising up to to their own to their own land and showing this might saying what what they who they hell are they Right and being frightened, so this was a very important symbol. The, the The Muslims did the same thing with Santiago as well, right? When they seized it, they they didn't profane. They they showed it was typical of Spain. They showed the Islam actually was protecting the sanctuary, right? So to win over the Christian population, which is like exactly what the Christians did, right? When Christians reconquered uh, conquered Toledo during the Reconquista, they the first they t was to declare themselves as emperors of the Christians, of the Muslims, and of the Jews. Of the Iberian Peninsula as properly their, their, their protectors. right? Because it was all about winning this dramatically fragmented reality. In a way that doesn't find any comparison with Spain in the history in the history of Europe, objectively, um, for for many reasons, but now we can't digress on it. So, here it, it, it's useless to dwell on the Battle of Tours that we will discuss in another video uh, from a tactical point of view. Uh, even here, the the deal is that um, the victory was won, but it was kind of not a full one. The the Muslims actually retreated in good order. They still had forces in Gaul, elsewhere, that would remain there. Uh, this was a great, um, uh, you know, uh, symbolical achievement, though, that the Carolingians were clever and shrewd to exploit immediately with the massive instruments um, that, that were ideological instruments that were um, the legacy of the Merovingian monarchy historically speaking Charles Martel was depicted as the one who properly had fought against the infidels had won right so he had defend guarded Christianity it is fair to say that uh, Poitiers um, um, uh, stopped the Islamic tide in the west right um, the uh, the Islam d didn't stand a chance to, to conquer Europe Right at some point in Umayyad times, we were fantasizing about, about, you know, even from the, the precarious geographical understanding of, you know, maybe attacking, you know, crossing Europe, but to attack Constantinople from the west in a pincer of women. So they didn't even, even consider Europe as such. They considered Constantinople. It's very fast, fascinating to see how um, in Muslim geographical notions of Europe stopped essentially to their 
trade um, uh, penetrativity, penetrativity capacity. So that is to say, the, the, the Muslims had a dramatically advanced cartographic science by the time, but they basically they weren't interested about what wasn't in the range of their of their direct intervention. So that they had a vague idea of what France was. They they, they properly underestimated the Franks. This is true. But we have to understand them as well, because here the whole objective, uh, the, the whole clash of Poitiers, was not a clash, as we were saying, between Christian Franks and Muslim. Um, I don't even know how to say this, because there, there were, it was plenty of Christians in their army as well. Um, it was a battle over Aquitaine. That is to say, the Franks wanted, just like the Arabs, to invade a, a foreign country that was Aquitaine for controlling it themselves. And Charles Martel scored a big hit in here because the raid was halted. So the Muslims came back to Spain. Some of them remained in the very south of Spain. But Aquitaine, after this wave of Islamic uh, raiding, was sensibly weakened. Otto of Aquitaine had actually fled to Francia, where he had met Charles Martel uh, in, in Paris, who had run, by the way, to him to talk to him because he basically now he had lost his land. So he was, he, as we were saying before, the Aquitanians didn't like the Franks at all. But at this point, you know, it was like they had been overrun by, by the Muslims. Uh, Otto would ask for the help, the help of the Carolingians. Yes, Aquitaine, uh, Otto's power in Aquitaine was restored, but now as a vassal of the Carolingians. And this is the point. The, the Franks basically, in one shot with, with, with Tour, managed to knock out... Aquitaine, which was the major political and strategical achievement of the Battle of Tours, that nobody discusses because oh, it's because they stopped the man. No, they basically swallowed Aquitaine, right? And and from there, that would be very important for the Franks because they started doing what the Aquitanians had been doing up to that point. That is to say, interfering from their position in into Iberian affairs. Um. So, definitely, St. Martin, in the occasion of tour, as a saint bishop demonstrated, uh, he, he was up to the task of his fame of warrior and of protector in battle, right? Uh, the Carolingians managed to exploit, beautifully, this victory to gain, actually, an international prestige as the leaders of the Christian effort, namely... Albeit this effort would mostly be directed against other uh, realities, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, including the Aquitanians that were fellow Christians. Ah, by the way, in 731, while the, the Muslims were attacking Aquitaine, the Franks attacked Bourges, right at the same time. So they were attacked. The, the Franks and the Muslims were attacking Aquitaine at the same time. No, they were not coordinated. But uh, Charles Martel wanted to see how. You know, uh, weak the 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 Aquitanian frontier was at that point, testing it for further campaign, right? So Tour was a big, um, you know, it was an it was a necessary um, stand, right? Because if what would have been the alternative to the battle, of, well, they the 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 Franks at that point would have had uh, essentially. Uh, yeah, um, a, a Muslim held Aquitaine, right? Even though precariously, but still, with you know, with enemies launching raids with the, the on the Loire frontier and creating lots of problems in this regard. Uh, at that point, it was, uh, you know, good to, to to withstand the invasion, to to destroy the enemy field forces, to basically secure in one shot instead the, the, the Frankish control over Aquitaine, um, and. Yeah, that's pretty much it. But the main deal here was 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 for the Carolingians to protect themselves, the champions of Christianity, in order to interfere in the Italian affairs with the papacy um, against the Byzantine presence uh, to to also test basically the. Uh, at this point, they weren't interested in invading Italy yet, right? Because they had already you know, enough problems on their own, but still assuming this important connection that had always existed and now was revived since Vermingian times between the papacy and the Gallic and the Frankish church proper that had had historically a very close connection way before Charlemagne, the empire and all those things. 
Um, so, yes, um, in, uh, in October 732, some say 733, whatever, but the raid of Abd ar Rahman al Ghafiqi, who died in battle, by the way, was stopped around uh, Tour, some say Poitiers, because Poitiers was passed by by the Muslim troops. We don't know exactly, precisely, the, the route was held, but Poitiers was well fortified because it had the ancient Roman uh, walls, so they, they didn't spend time uh, besieging it. They wanted to reach Tour for ideological, ideological reasons that we were, we were listing before. Um, but we don't know. Probably Abdurrahman made uh, he began the campaign well, right? But he probably made some mistake, and uh, however, he didn't have the amount of force necessary to you know to advance much further than than Tour. Uh, but as we were saying before, he might have established a bridge head, a bridge head in you know just next door to Neustria. It would have been an important problem for for the Franks. Um, and even if he had managed to sack the sanctuary of Tours and he had uh, an, uh, announced the names of God and Muhammad from the top of of those towers, he wouldn't surely have arrived to impose the Quran at uh, Oxford, in spite of what, you know, 1,000 years afterwards, Gibbon, together with lots of other things, believed. Um, uh, you know, Christianity at that point was rising massively by a scale that, you know, it, it would have taken much more, right, and possibly nothing that 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 Islam could put up, up, up that distance to, to, to oust Christianity from Europe. Right, that would have never happened. Um, but um, the Franks, however, on their side, had feared, right? Because they had objectively been showed that a new aggressive power could fundamentally enter Gaul from a day, from a year to another, uh, to 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 threaten their their their. Their control, you know, this, this sphere, you see, Aquitaine was another country, but ideally was still within the sphere of the Franks. So somebody stepped in goal said, wow, wait a second, right? And these are an army, they're, they're, they are they have this capacity of projection, they're offensive. They knew they had overrun Spain, they knew they had overrun the Mediterranean, that something was, was going on, this was not a normal thing, right? So the shock surely existed. Right, uh, so much that even after Poitiers, um, in spite uh, Europe wasn't, you know, hadn't been threatened, uh, Christian Europe hadn't been threatened in, in an ideological sense, but you know, Gaul was not freed by the Muslim raids either. Right, so the the Battle of Poitiers notoriously didn't kick out anyone. Uh, the Muslims were all over the place in, in southern Gaul. Uh, after that, as we've seen for, for for hundreds of years, and specifically in the next years, right, um, the, the, the 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 posthumous splendor of the Battle of Tour is actually sh- overshadowed by the the humbling truth that after you know in like in 734. The Arabs uh, that had remained settled in the Narbonne sacked Arles, right? One of the most important cities of Southern Gaul. They ran the entire province. In 737, um, uh, they they occupied Avignon. They reached Burgundy. They raided an enormous quantity of slaves to bring to Spain, right? Um, so. Uh, the Battle of Poitiers couldn't stop this, right? The Franks didn't have at this point yet the uh, properly the, the projection capabilities because they they weren't still politically consolidated as much as they would start rising in the following centuries. And in fact, one aspect that um, at some point we will have also to look at in in greater detail is uh, the the connection. Uh, of uh, you know, say the the Arab between the Arab threat and the organization uh, of a Frankish cavalry, because Charles Martel, you know, um, is objectively the sovereign that more than everybody began a systematic uh, 
that policy of um, confiscation of ecclesiastical land also because of the newly acquired Aquitanian territory that had historically belonged to uh, the Merovingians, to royal authority, and that over the centuries after the disgregation of, of the Frankish Empire, the kingdom had become basically four kingdoms in one by the, the end of the 7th century, um, had been occupied by these other uh, Lords that were very very often bishops, ecclesiastics themselves. So this also actually mm, produced an, a negative uh, press, you know, we can say anachronistically, uh, towards uh, Charles from the same ecclesiastical sources because they they these were the men who had been stripped of this important estates that Charles used to reward his uh, his army, his his troops. Um, there is a, uh, you know, did the Arabs mm, contribute mm, importantly to this or not? Well, um, I would say that the projection capabilities of the Carolingian Empire at this point were much increased by the new, um, by the new range of control that the Carolingians exercised, especially in this important areas of southern. Uh, gold are very vast, right? The the, the long the, the the down, uh, the southern you go, uh, the larger the earth expands. I mean, extensionally, you still have an enormous amount of land. But Francia altogether was a bit more compact, right? The raids they had launched were uh, within the the reach, let's say, of, of you know a small you know uh, moderate distance from from the Frankish frontier proper. Now the Arab threat posed definitely the needs to to project uh, military, Frankish military power more far. But uh, by themselves, I don't think that the Arabs and any other specific uh, Frankish enemy at this time and later on among the the many the, we can talk about the Saxons, the Avars, the Longobards, the the you know with even within the same uh, Carolingian Empire. At this point, there were important rebellions of these uh, aristocracies, etc. What brought to the rise not much of cavalry in itself, right? But definitely the um, the uh, consolidation of a proper professional force that could be out there in every situation for a very prolonged time, and that therefore was best, you know, when specialistic and kind of elite in the form of cavalry, still not with the size of change in the ratio of cavalry infantry that you could imagine through the 8th century, it was a, a, a secular, multi-secular process, objectively brought uh, the Franks to, to, to bring to that, that the, the rise of that professional elite that was unknown in Europe at the time. I mean, Latin Germanic Europe, no people had developed a, a professional uh, elite prop from a military point of view um, uh, there was a kind of a part time kind of war in the other countries, and even the elite was more either poorer or more civilized let's say more gentrified I would say that than, than the Franks that objectively did truly like if you ha yeah the Franks did only one thing and nothing else war, and for this reason they did it best than anybody else. That's the only thing they did. They didn't do anything else. There was nothing um, outside uh, uh, war in the mind of a Frankish elite. Nothing. By any stretch of it, these people couldn't read. They, they didn't admit it. It was just about war. And that's how they kept the thing together. And this is a reality that uh, existed in Gaul since, since centuries. Right? This was true since the late Roman times, even before. Right, Gaul was since Celtic times already something that where there was just a tiny elite of aristocrats who were about war, and just the, the, the rest of the people were servants basically. Um, Gaul had never suffered during the migration era a radical um, structural damage in there uh, in the in the Roman Latifundia estates. Right, so basically all these massive. Um, uh, amount of lands had been always concentrated in the hands of very few that could organize and had resources to organize something more elite. In fact, we tend to underestimate how cavalry was important already by Charles Martel's times in general, right? Looking at other 
peoples that were credited to be by the same Franks, by, you know, international uh, etiquette and, uh, you know, um, appreciation um, as horsemen, the best horsemen around. We're talking about the Longobards, Visigoths, right? Traditionally, these people, but the Franks were, during the migration era, the, the, probably um, except the the Scandinavians, basically the, or the, the Germans, let's say the Saxons, um, the, the Germanic people that made the least use of cavalry. Right, even in here we don't have to be radical. The least, it's relative. It's not absolute. They had their cavalry, right? Even it's an important one at some level. But um, this privatization of the empire had brought to the rise, to the proliferation of these. Even a small aristocrat, by Frankish standards, had a, a military retinue, right? So what the Carolingians did was to fuel, to concentrate, to consolidate this state of uh, this reality by extending their control rewarding their own clientels with these lands to in exchange for the the military service the, hence the vassalitic beneficiary system uh etc and therefore having compared to other peoples much greater amount of heavy cavalry available right together with lots of other things because the infantry was still there of course on mass Carolin uh, you know carolingian armies were pretty pretty sizable right they were recruited over literally a half of europe so uh, they they were also pretty international, right? All the elites of all the various subjugated people regularly participated. They had to contribute. They they enriched even the Carolingian military practice, and they they fought basically against everybody. They fought against the Saxons. They had very diff different tactics: the Avars, the Longobards, the Arabs, the Bretons. Um, uh, this is you know remarkable in the history of Europe, and and, and the Carolingians were definitely about all about war. It, this is a similar dynamic that they had, such as the one that brought the Roman emperors of the 3rd, 4th century AD to introduce the uh, comitatenses in their own armed forces. It wasn't a match, uh, much about the mobility of the force. It's not that if you increase the amount of cavalry, you actually have a speedier army. More often than not, on strategic you know, especially the sedentary peoples with the, the dramatic ones, the different breeds, etc. It's it's different, but actually, infantry armies on the long run are speedier strategically than the mounted ones. The the important is to have an elite, right? Cavalry was not important much strategically, if not as 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 a force properly on the field, right? It, it hasn't to do with mobility, with that capacity of projection, but definitely having a professional force as such increased the 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 mobility as well, because these people basically knew how to make war uh, without even asking, right? They provided everything. They they presented themselves in, in the market field, and they um, they would simply go at war, right? And and they were habituated to it. They didn't do anything else, as we were saying before. Um, so um, that's why the Carolingians were. Um, uh, you know, capable of putting up this together. And this this has to do not much with the Arab frontier or any other one specifically, but rather the size that the Carolingian domains properly were assuming. That is to say, if I have to go back from, you know, sack from Germany to, to Aquitaine, from Brittany to Italy, I need um, I need an army that I can rely on, organizationally speaking. In fact, the the... the Actually, from from a properly military point of view, the greater Carolingian achievements were were essentially logistical. Was were the, was the organization that actually stood even properly behind the army was the the, the organization of local resources of the administration to provide supplies, the forage especially for the horses to shift this devastating military machine on the battlefields of Europe with you know the due you know. Um, uh, capacities and uh, you know competence and so care combat effectiveness um, and so on right but properly the the importance of cavalry is rising on the field right just like in late roman times cavalry doesn't make strategic mobility it's about the tactical need to have it now right because um, which is different from roman times because from roman times we also about coping with raiders, with troops that, you know, had, but there wasn't much, uh, at least the Romans never 
were capable to match uh, the heaviest cavalry, such as the cataphracts on the field. They replicated them with not much success. In Carolingian times, it was a very different reality, because Carolingian times was, was taking the form of a feudal society. So that was fundamentally based on, on the social preeminence of those who fought on horseback. Because now these few uh, people were so individually wealthy because of the raided land, the conquered lands, that they could afford this dramatic individual capacity of, to, to fight on horseback with the proper equipment and skill, etc., to be this devastating impact in force on the field. But still, you know, if you were to see this in diachronically from how things had evolved, which it took a lot of centuries, right? Really a lot of centuries, like the stirrups. I'm saying, you know, the Carolingians began to use it when they crushed the hours. Probably what they were already around in, in a way or another, but they were, they were insignificant, right? The syrup was introduced not because it was, oh, discovered syrup. No, it's because for the first time, these cavalries has had the degree of individual and collective training to perform a cavalry charge that n n required the, the, the knights properly impact against the enemy in a way that they hadn't been used before. So the stirrup helped uh, in that sense, but um, it, it was just a consequence of, of the pregress military development. Always remember that, right? The technology doesn't make tactics. It's the other way around. It, it does contribute a little bit, but it's always like the, the, the it has the, the, the lower end, right? Um, so... Definitely, having now you see strategically, it, it, it's it, it's a it's not and politically in the first place. It, it wasn't good to have the southwestern frontier so exposed, right? So much that between 736 and 739 were continuous campaigns by Charles Martel, so-called now nick, nicknamed because he was either Little Mars or properly the Martel that, that is the Hammer right out of the Muslims, in fact, against the Muslims, in the south of Gaul, uh, and actually their Christian accomplices, because as we were seeing, you know, still, yes, uh, Spain was ruled by Muslims, their leads were Muslim, but the majority of people were Christian. And many properly free Christians in the north were also siding with the Muslims to launch raids in, in Gaul, right? Because that's how distant words uh, properly and culturally they didn't care they could make money there's an unstable area everybody joins right if you know look at world history even today uh, right it, it, if you have to make money you go fight anywhere what's the, the matter of course there was some ideological motivation behind it but more practically what would you think that a 8th century Basque cared about that Right, honestly. So, uh, and in fact, as in all the frontier areas, um, there proliferated double crossing, betrayal, um, cooperation in its more also shaded and ambiguous forms. Right, some say that even Odo of Aquitaine at some point had, of course, negotiated with the Muslims, even in anti Frankish function. Then eventually, the campaign of Poitiers demonstrates that uh, how dangerous that is because of course that was directed to crush Aquitaine in, in a way but um, it's always like that right um, there was uh, revenge mm -hmm. these were you know what was the world uh, in, in the, at the frontier it's mafia right mobsters rule there is no state who rules what do you think it's like this is pure mafia like in most uh, all over the world at that point there, there wasn't any I mean you know, what, what were the Frankish accounts, factually, in the place where they lived? They were mobsters. There is no, um, no doubt. It's pre-industrial history. Before the state, there is just the mob, nothing else in the world. Um, it's pure violence, charisma, individuality, uh, subtraction, slavery. Uh, that's the normal face of early medieval times. Um, so... Towards the mid-8th century, the situation seems to stabilize, right? With the stop of the Muslim push, hmm, albeit um, the majority of Languedoc remained in the hands of the Arabs, and also of the, actually, um, a surviving um, Gothic elite, hmm, 
that cooperated with them. Yes, those Gothic refugees at some point say, okay, you know what, these, these guys can't overrun us, let's simply cooperate with them, right? Let's enjoy the decentralized position of southern Gaul, given that the center of Muslim power is southern Spain, it's pretty far, and so because the Franks are actually a much greater tra uh, threat to them. And just a bit later, Pippin, at this point properly king of the Franks, because he had been anointed by the, the Pope, who received the permission to, to dethrone the, the, the last Merovingians, or whatever they were, because actually they, they were just literally puppets sometimes. Probably Kilperic III seemingly wasn't even a true Merovingian, was just a guy, they, they took the place on the throne. And um, so Pippin managed to reinforce actually the Frankish presence in the south to properly um, kick out at that point Islam, right, and to um, of, of Gaul, out of Gaul, and to stretch towards the Mediterranean, what we know as Francia, Francia, that at th this point also stretched you know, very far to other directions. For example, I don't know, across the Rhine in the east, also, Narbonne capitulated to the Franks in 759. This phase is very important because, um, as we will see uh, with the crisis of the Carolingian Empire, the, the Saracens will come back, chiefly from the sea in southern Gaul, and they will remain there basically uh, almost uh, yeah, the, the beginning of the 11th century. Um, but this reinforced Frankish power under Charles Martel first stops the tide, and Pippin reinforces the air, secures, uh, closes that. Um, that uh, Septimanian highway, let's say, that connection between France and Gaul, right? And that was crucial for the Franks because uh, it, it was more difficult to cross the Pyrenees somewhere else, right? It was easier to, to pass from the Mediterranean coast where there was more, you know, the, the, the passage was easier. Um, it also simply directly connected with also with the most advanced areas in Spain uh, there in, in the area. So, uh, this was particularly easy, important for the Franks because now they had the power to properly form a bulwark and to stop this, to, to, to close this gap from which the, the Muslims could pour into Gaul, right? So there is a resuming of the Frankish-Arab War, but it's, it's wrong to call it like this, as we have seen, um, decisively um, happened after years of, however, uninterrupted uh, skirmishes, raids, uh, etc. Since um, 777, when the valley of Barcelona and Gerona, or Gerona um, turned to Charlemagne to implore help against the Caliph of Cordoba. Right, so, obviously, there was a Muslim ruler of the northeastern Spain what do they do? Exactly what they had hap what had happened with the Aquitanians. They ask for Christian help to fight their fellow Muslims in the south. Um, as we were saying before, we can't digress on the situation of Sp in Spain at that point because it would be very interesting. But we'll leave it for another video. Well, just say that Muslim Spain at that point was split by r rivalries, contrasts, and how it would have happened three centuries later in um, cru in the Syria of the Crusades, the, say, it's called the Christian War of Charles, actually came to insert itself into a landscape of civil war among the same Saracens. And also in this case, Charles' attitude was the one of whom attacks in order to pre prevent. Right, the idea was to show that the Franks uh, were the stronger power uh, of the, uh, you know, the Pyrenean watersheds, and that he could bring war into Spain, as the the Muslims had wanted to uh, had wanted uh, for the years before, under uh, Charlemagne's grandfather, to 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 score big in in Gaul, to say, okay, we are the stronger one now. The Franks had enough power. The, the tide had l really turned, and the um, and the Franks would intervene. So the, the Pyrenees line was not at all secured. Right, uh, center southern France also was very unstable, uh, very prone to betrayal, uh, 
uh, toward the, the same uh, the same Franks. Uh, so Charlemagne also was too much absorbed by the uh, German questions against the Saxons. There, therefore, he was far from the south of his possessions. Um, but as we were saying before, there, there was an ideological prestige deriving from fighting uh, against the pagans, and more than the pagans, actually the, the infidels, uh, as properly uh, what ha appeared as an alter ego of the Christian tradition had been ousted elsewhere, because, um, you see, the Saxons were pagans, so, okay, there, there isn't much to do, you, you, you can't, uh, you know, go there, massacre them, uh, without any problem. Uh, in Spain, the Muslims even oppressed the Christian populations, and it is difficult to establish up to which point, by the way, Charles knew or better ignored how, in reality, uh, how, you know, actually generous by those time standards such, let's call it oppression, was, and how willingly uh, the Christians of Spain actually cooperated most of the times with the Saracens. But that was not even important. Who cares? Who did know? Right, those were still Muslim-held power, and, and that was enough, right? And it would confer to the Franks, when fighting against them, a huge prestige in Christianity, in front especially of the renewed, uh, you know, uh, at that point, uh, you know, the, the, the Carolingians had invaded Italy, they had entered in direct connection with the Papas, he had already strengthened before very important ties with them, so... Uh, it was particularly important also in the face of, of, of Byzantine claims on the Italian peninsula to say, you know, war the Franks, why did you do this? You know, to, to be now the perfect champions of fate, to be the the the, the, the rulers of Europe now, that the, the, the imperial ideology was being harbored. The, the Franks were uh, psychologically, emotionally through, through the roof also in terms of self the, the Franks were, always remember, after the Jews and the Romans were the, the third people obsessed with their with their role in history they they they, they were the chosen people uh, uh the carolingians were actually more more old testament than than the gospels right you know they Char charlemagne was obsessed with david he he saw this himself as this you know this mis misrepresentation also of the enemies like you know the the, the carolingian empires david against goliath the barbarian the where actually was the carolingian empire to be the freaking Goliath here and swallowing basically every people around. But still was important is that this was a sacred enterprise, that that the Frankish military power had been God given, right? And that their legitimization as rulers came through the success, the blood spilled against the enemies of the faith. Right? This this was the the, the Carolingians were radically imbued with this. It was the the the, the, the traditional Merovingian hematophilia and, and the, the warlike and ever more professional imperialistic mindset of of the Carolingian dynasty that, that had brought this to, to the to the grandeur of the empire that we know in, 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 the, in the European tradition in uh, in the legacy of the same empire that outlived the, the, the Carolingians even after the disgregation of, of, of any factual power right it would occur one century later. Um, it's the yeah, literally the obsession with the divine glory conferred to the virtues, to the brave. It had, the, the Franks had taken the, the Roman Empire because they were purer than the Romans in the, in the eyes of God. There was no other way. It was the same pagan ideal uh, standing behind that. The pagans believed exactly the same thing, and the Christians believed exactly the same thing. There is no earthly power without... Uh, military glory deriving from individual virtue. If the Carolingians ruled half of Europe, that couldn't be ignored by anyone. By any legalistic sophistry like the one that the Byzantines had said, no, we are because only emperors can elect other emperors. Look, it's written here. No, it, actually the Carolingian um, mindset was much more coherent with the originary Roman idea of empire. That is to say, wh whoever emerges for, 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 for capacity for, for actual military might, an individual worth owns the imperium, right? 
and how the Franks owned the Imperium with their warlike aristocracy. So the army gathered by Charlemagne for the Spanish campaign of 778, quite famous in history, was very heterogeneous because uh, at this point the empire stretched on this enormous amount of European territories and it was very multi-ethnic in nature. There were Austrasians, Burgundians, Bavarians, Provencals, Septimanians, Longobards, right? Uh, the Longobards had been called by by actually by Charles Martel during the 30s of the, at the time of, of Poitiers to, to actually check uh, Provence that for, you know, it seems that eventually there was no need for intervention, but still they they counted on them. So these were all, uh, the, in this army was plenty of representatives of the elites and uh, the armies of all these subjected peoples. Um, this uh, expedition 778 is will also be analyzed somewhere else. Uh, it wasn't a brilliant one. In fact, it was the one during which on August the, the 15th, 778, at least this, the uh, most common date by tradition, took place the famous and debated episode of Roncesvalles, right? Um, so, you know what happened. The, 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 the Carolingian army was almost wiped out. It, the, 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 the rear guard was basically sacrificed itself into an am- during an ambush, right, of, of Basques, right? The story um, that we know, it was the Saracens. No, they, they were actually Basques. It was actually Christians, by the way. Um, but it, um, it was a, an, important, uh, an important blow. The, uh, however, even in here, the, the Carolingians managed to transform this uh, tragic episode into an ideological tool because the um, rising, uh, the newborn knighthood drew an incentive to its military construction and a poetic ideological motive for the future that was the martyrdom of Roland. Right, so the idea that the knight is, of course, uh, Miles Christi, that fights to the death with this enormous sense of duty, with this ferocious, um, you know, uh, combativity due to, to the motivation, naturally Roland, Roland, right, these men were, the, the Franks were borderline Christian, let's be honest about this, if you look at what they were, they, these people didn't understand the difference, they didn't understand, you know, let's be honest, they just believed that praying the Christian God, they would receive victory, they were all imbued with, uh, you know, ideas of sagas, of chants, you know, they, they, they had a very fascinating mindset, you know, I don't know what it'd give to have a psychiatrist properly, you know, uh, analyzing a, a Carolingian um, uh, count mind because these people were, were were trained since they were little to do nothing but exterminating people right um, that's literally the only thing they did uh, if not horse riding and so you know and being obsessed with their own weapons and having the, the thinking that they were magic that there was a spirit inside them that they would kill you know and, and th- that's the only thing that they would do because that was the only thing that the society required them to do and they had to do it best. That's why it was the only thing that they were required to do. Uh, so in the in the rout of Roncesvalles, in the massacre of the Frankish rearguard, well, yes, there would be this kind of people, of paladins. Even if we don't know about Roland, and of course his fate, of he exists. I mean, he was he's an actual figure, but um, in many other battles. Um, you know, there, there was a Roland that, you know, was surrounded by some Carolingian enemy and fought uh, to the death, uh, like, you know, spilling blood uh, everywhere. And it, this uh, this was the, the kind of stories that exalted these people, right? People were literally exalted. And to do this in the, in the name of faith, so much that they would substitute the figure of the Arab here as the the enemy, and rather than what the reality was actually behind this battle, is very eloquent because the important was to do it for the faith. There's a pre-crusading reality because you know that um, is this Reconquista in a sense? Well, kind of, right? The Reconquista is uh, you know traditionally 
I don't know, I, I guess it starts with the same Islamic conquest uh, at some levels, right? But this very important dynamic of Frankish knights actually going to fight in the Iberian Peninsula for a reason or another, mostly, namely, fighting against Islam, but also as mercenaries fundamentally, also for the same Muslims um, sometimes, is a big light motive of uh, the Senior Reconquista history. Um, and this always happening when the Fran uh, when the, the Franks and the Papacy were together in especially essentially extirpating the last um, let's say uh, autonomy of the Iberian Church in the north in exchange for military help. Right, in, uh, they would simply uh, have to accept the Roman right that the Iberians technically hadn't followed because with the councils of Toledo they had kind of another view of them, kind of another ecumenic center of Christianity that was competing with Rome um, historically then. At this point they were about to be wiped out by, by the, the Muslims They said, okay, well, we, we accept the Roman right, but please Pope help us to tr throughout the, you know, the alliance with the Franks, all this thing. We're a lot of ref of Visigothic refugees also going to places like, I don't know, Italy. We have codes from there. It's, they're very fascinating because they they tell you how, you know, closely related these wall uh, dynamics were all together. Um, so, well, Ronces Valve was, um, you know, its meaning at least was... was wide and, and surely exaggerated later on, but the coincidence, let's say, remains with Spain, with this world that was seen as a bit mis mysterious. Like, considered that for the same Muslims, the North Africa, especially, the partly also all Andalus, is, is, the, is the most distant area of the Muslims. It's from which the, the wicked magician comes in the in the stories, like, you know, in the tales of, of Muslim leg culture, etc. It's this borderline still pagan reality, so it's a bit what, I don't know. So the, the Franks would have this contempt towards a bit Spain as the exotic, strange, uh, you know, tricky reality, where Christians leave with Muslim, what's the deal with it? It's a bit like when the Normans conquered Sicily, they created a kingdom there. Well, the French and the German crusaders looked at them and said, oh, these are Poulain, these are bastards, because they live still among some Arabs. They, they have, uh, you know, they're, they're distant, right? There's something else. Well, there are other reasons for that, but... It's still important to 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 understand the mystics behind um, what the holy war here was about. There was properly the creation of a, an ideological boundary to say, from one side there are the Christians, from another side there are the Muslims, right? And for, surely from from the Gallic side there were, there were Christians. The problem is that from the uh, the Iberian side there were not just the Muslims at all. There were also lots, actually, primarily Christians as well. Um, so if the um, Arab-Hispanic incursions across the Pyrenees had stopped, as we've, as we've seen before Charlemagne, what would actually take the upper hand in the process, um, you know, in this struggle? Were the Saracen fleets, flotillas, that remained a continuous threat for the Mediterranean coasts. So the um, Muslim sailors slash pirates slash merchants just like the vikings essentially they had their bases in uh, northern africa and in spain and that between the ninth and the like the end of the ninth and the beginning of the 10th century uh held sicily having stripped it from the byzantines and they had bridgeheads such as fraxinetum in provence uh, uh the the garigliano and um and uh, Agropoli in, um, uh, in uh, Carigliano would be says, close to Rome, relatively. Uh, uh, Agropoli in Campania, and also Santa Severina in Calabria. Bari, uh, Otranto in Apulia, they, they created properly emirates in there, right? These were coastal areas, but were not uh, less dangerous, because from there they could essentially um, supply these raids for further away. Right, they didn't have much of an interland penetration properly, even demographically. They these weren't uh, colonies 
population colonies, but they they basically were a net that allowed even anybody who wanted to join, including many Saracens were actually Christian. Uh, this is true even for the Eastern Mediterranean. In, in the world mess that happened in the Eastern Mediterranean when the Byzantine Empire was, like, I don't know, the Saracens took Crete, uh, Cyprus, the, the other... Can you actually, by picking a pirate in there, you can actually say, you know, those are only Christians or Muslims. They, they were mixed all the time. Leaving aside that the first Muslim fleets were all Christian because they were basically from Alexander, from from uh, from Palestine, from Syria, right? They were all Christian mm, sailors, uh, engineers, etc. You know, the, the Arabs also didn't have anything like that when they came out of the desert. Um, so another, yet another proof that uh, the the major territorial acquisitions happened in lands that actually had benefited from their at least the elite's point of view from 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 the the, the Islamic conquest itself. Um, so in in Western Mediterranean we can speak through this now uh, this coastal for um, yeah um, settlements specifically of a Saracen telesocracy. Right, because at the time there weren't Christian fleets to contrast them. This is a very interesting picture because eventually, as we talked about in those videos about the Saracens, um, it's during Saracen times that the Christians will start building their own fleets, which they will actually sweep the the, the Western Mediterranean in the early 11th century of the same Muslim presence again in the upper hand. Because these coastal centers, at the end of the day, had entered into the Islamic trade and market, right? They minted their own coins, whatever the, those things. So um, you don't see, like, the tide turning there uh, after a period of, like, devastation where nothing had happened. You have massive na military uh, naval engineering capacities and dramatic naval power coming from, from single cities like Pisa, like Genoa like Amalfi, that had fundamentally, uh, up to that point, in theory, they should have been just, you know, ravaged and pre it didn't happen. These guys had, there was something that they had been building for a very long time. And this happened in the same Saracen times. We have to learn how to reread that period, because even in here, it's uh, it's no better than, than ideological, right? For the Vikings, we passed from demonization from the 19th century uh, for nationalistic reasons, um, to uh, to the now the the, the champions of uh, you know freedom, equality, famine. The, the Scandinavians it was one of the most radically violent, and especially in Viking times, oppressive. You know, speaking of private power, you know, slavery. Uh, you know, even you know, you know, conservatives. Said, you know, Vikings basically lived and achieved what they did by exporting Christian slaves. Right. That's that's the, how the thing happened. Well, with the Saracens, no. Right, there's just a demonization because, you know, we live in the age of uh, emotional teens obsessed with their skin color, so no, we can't say, of course, that anything like that happened in the Mediterranean was meaningful or interesting or whatever, um, or comparable or even more actually important than what was happening during the Viking era. But um, the truth actually historically tells us something way more interesting. And it's complicated to study these things also because... Uh, so sometimes it's literally there are like they're mostly under documented uh, realities. It is true that Muslim presence in places like, for example, in Sicily has been overly uh, emphasized, like saying, ah, this was such an event. It's not really true. Um, the, the Caliphate of Cordoba was was really a state, right? And even they, they, that was much a bigger thing. Uh, the central and western, in the central Mediterranean especially lacked a true major power and this was a, one of the reasons why it's difficult to re, re, uh, re evaluate a bit what, what was happening there. In fact, but the most interesting thing in fact comes from the studying of of southern Italy mostly which is a much better documented reality, at least, you know, especially the non-Muslim area where you realize and we talked about this um, in the Saracen videos that the Muslims, just like the Vikings did, basically in, in Gaul with, with St. Franks that hired them and to, to throw at them at one another, actually got very shrewdly mixed into the local rivalries, right? 
um, serving as mercenaries, this or that prince against their Christian adversaries. Right, so that was not even different from what the same Charlemagne in 778 had uh, behaved towards the Muslims in Spain themselves. Um, so uh, if it hadn't been for the local powers, once again, that actually favored and actually demanded properly the intervention of, of the Saracens, the Saracens would have not made a headway. Right? It was mostly about local rivalry. That also explains why these areas eventually boomed. Uh, up, as e even before the end of the Saracen period uh, to properly blossom in, in, in the immediately later period because of course there was some pressure posed by this but it was also a, a, an instability that was produced by the same powers right? it was exploited, I don't know, by the Normans in certain cases eventually by the, the, Mar the Italian maritime republics for example there were meaningful episodes, however, because we're talking about the Franks, right? And the Franks, as you know, had a kingdom of Italy. Charlemagne, differently from any other um, uh, country that conquered in Europe, when he conquered uh, the Longobard kingdom, maintained the uh, the local um, the, the name of the local crown. Charlemagne was king of the Franks and the Longobards, and the, the Italic administration was dramatically advanced. The, 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 the Charlemagne, uh, Louis de Pius, also the later, you know, the Carolingians of Italy properly drew handfully for um, the, the Longobard administration that, in spite of what is commonly prejudicially believed, was the single most advanced administrative system in Latin Germanic Europe. At the time of the conquest and trying to, for the Carolingians, trying to, to centralize, to further in their lands that absolutely had nothing like that by themselves, but eventually failing, but still, you know, having an important contribution coming from, from the Longbird legacy. Well, this kingdom was also the most important of the Carolingian Empire. It was the one to which the imperial title was attached, right? Uh, it was always the same old story. These were northerners that wanted to. To, to, to centralize in Italy a universal empire like the Ottonians would like to do, like the Swabians would like to do. Why? Because there was a freaking public administration and culture, right? Something that north of the Alps didn't exist. Uh, and that was, you know, for just the, sh the sheer, you know, political, strategical relevance, you know, the idea that, that in Italy there was Rome. Point. That would be the only thing for any Roman emperor that w were starting to call themselves like them now, to contend uh, power to the Byzantines, ideologically in that sense, but also having this major, freaking populated and rich, this is the richest country per capita in, 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 in Europe, uh, up to the end of the 17th century, to... Um, to properly launch maritime expeditions, to, to that's something basically everyone would try to do, con reconquer Constantinople from there. The Carolingians don't make it, of course. They couldn't. Um, it was difficult for them to, uh, as you know, eventually also, before the Ottonians, Italy slept away from, from control. But um, properly, that was the only place where an empire could work, right? And this is not by chance, as we were saying before. Here, it's basically 300 years after the end of the Roman Empire. These were the, the most advanced areas in Europe. It was a, a lit, there is literacy, there is, uh, there is trade, there, there is a, a revival in economical activities. That are, there is probably a, a written culture. There are documents. Uh, these people create castles basically to selling them on a market of castles. Right? You know, uh, it, it's something incredible. Um, and, of course, uh, the Carolingians of Italy try to, to secure this area, which is very difficult to do, because the main threat actually comes from, um, from the center, but especially the south. Like, you know, the Apennines that run throughout the, the, the center and the south are uh, very tough ground, as much, you know, that's another nightmare to, to fight in for any, uh, you know, for any army in history. Well, the, the 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 Italic Kingdom is mostly what the what the, the Longobard base had been. It is the Po Valley and Tuscany practice. Then they have this problem of reaching Rome because the Papacy also is powerful enough by itself by certain standards to have a huge uh, estate um, in in all over the central Italy and. South it's all fragmented. There are still the Longobard duchies, and there are the Saracens further south. And this um, 
brings two episodes that eventually, as in the broader crisis of the Carolingian Empire, will manifest in Italy as well, in terms of properly territorial control. We must say that Carolingian rulers of Italy weren't bad. They tried, they, they also launched successful campaigns for the time standards, even against the Saracens. They, they, sub, they, they had an important activity there, we can see at some point. But still, the Saracens by sea, which the Carolingians do not control because they, they are they're essentially just a land power. They they don't have except they, they built Charlemagne built something uh in the north, small but it wasn't enough. You know, it didn't have a naval to the maritime tradition, right? The Saracens come to sack the basilicas of Saint Peter and Saint Paul uh outside the the walls of Rome. Uh so this is a massive ideological blow as well. Right, this is the darkest hour. Uh, this brought the Carolingian Ludwig II. Uh, this happened in 846, right, to organize in southern Italy an expedition that um, actually brought to the destruction of the Beneventan, Cor uh, Beneventan Corsair nest in the year after. But the following attempts of Ludwig II to destroy the Emirate of Bari right that was also here uh, a muslim emirate controlling essentially what had been a greek city a byzantine city right but and it was rival to the same sicilian aglabid power failed that tells you how how fragmented the situation actually was right these emirates of bari of um of taranto i said alternative before it's not um correct these were what were they Right, why do we call them emirates? Well, because basically these had been settled by these pirates that had proclaimed themselves like an independent emirate. And, th and, and in the mess that the Islamic world actually was, um, recognizing the emirate to these centers was something like saying, okay, you know, to, to play a card against your Islamic rivals, right? To say, okay, you know, that, that caliph said this, that other said that, because the, the, the big caliphate had split didn't exist anymore so uh, there was a, a ferocious competition um, and these didn't make uh, eventually much of a difference because the Saracens yes held the coasts of Western Christendom but they didn't have the force nor the intention to swarm in the interland they were just raids right there was no project of conquest because the local there was no major power that was leading that Right, uh, the Aglabids of Tunisia were the, the only ones that had enough landmass to to conquer Sicily, but they had a lot of trouble already to to control these two regions across the the, the Sicilian Channel. Uh, they didn't have strength properly to to venture further much uh, in in, this, in the southern Italian interland. It was too difficult. The the local powers were too entrenched. Right, um, the Umayyads were. Uh, excuse me, uh, the, the Caliphate of Cordoba was saying, like, okay, you know, we endorse you, but still they had too, too, much, too much problems on their own, and the Barren Peninsula was, was, was faring, like, on their own. They, they didn't have, like, a major fleet that they could use to send help to these powers, also because these powers also wanted to preserve their own autonomy, in a sense. And there were plenty of naval power, even if on a small scale individually, but still significantly altogether, right? It would have costed too much to get rid of them um, from the Mediterranean. It was no purpose. The, the, the Cordobans were okay with that because they say they keep harassing essentially the, the Western the Empire, right? And they were their competitors. And as long as they do, we profit, right? And we have no reason. For, for now, we will keep mostly uh, an eye on, on, our, uh, on them while we, we are busy in our Iberian stuff uh, in the Interland. It was pretty ser serious. So um, the Saracens also uh, led these important raids, chiefly in Italy, in southern Gaul. They even reached the Upper Rhineland at some point via land. But the local populations were, however, toughened by a continuous defense. The rustics enclosed themselves in fortified towns. Uh, they gathered around, uh, you know, equally fortified monasteries, uh, rocks, uh, you know, they, they, they had a very sophisticated uh, 
um, alarm um, system uh, to, to save also the, the herd, you know, the, the things in case of raid. All the, there was a, a great deal of, um, even in, if you study the, the local settlement dynamics in this, you're very fascinating. And also the local warrior elites were constantly pressured, right? They, the, the same communities obliged the knights to, um, to intervene ever more rapidly and to arm themselves always better to, uh, to compensate for the numerical deficiency. Uh, but uh, this, as we, we are saying, uh, uh, happened in a different context compared to the one we began with Gaul in Spain, because here, as, we, as you understand, there isn't a major land mass involved, there isn't a major wave uh, of Islamic invasion involved. It's basically harassment from the side of local pirates, right, coming even from Christian-held territories. Uh, and um, there is a constant, however, attrition that produces further organization, etc. And at some point, by the 10th century, it would be an important revival. The, the, the Italian powers, for example, all together managed to form an alliance to crush the, the Corsair nest on the Gardiano River, uh, after which, you know, the Saracens didn't come back anymore. Um, the, as we've seen, the, the, the maritime republics began to literally do the same thing the Saracens did before, but, you know, winning in their case and having properly city-states growing like crazy for in following centuries. Um, um, so it's also later, right? It's also properly when the St. Carolingian Empire is collapsing or has collapsed, right? But definitely this is part of the, say, the Frankish Arab struggle, if you really want to, to term it like that, as, as we repeat it improperly. But it, um, and it shows... I would say uh, the the complexity of, of these realities and how, at the end of the day, this clash is being constructed specifically from an ideological point of view to support the, the, the policies of the time so that when we read about it, we have to be very, you know, aware of this, at least. That is to say, the practice was, let's say, things like, I don't know, I don't know if you ever read the the Carolingian uh, capitularies. There, there was one from the Italic Kingdom during these expeditions of Ludwig, the, Ludwig II that were that was directed, if I'm not wrong, exactly against the Saracens. And before the expedition, this capitulary issued, literally, like to to the army, something like, in the approach of the land, avoid to commit adulteries, that is, rapes, and to burn monasteries, right? to sack monasteries, so to, to literally burn monasteries. That, that, is, that tells you pretty well what the, you know, what the religious divide could play concretely in a reality that was dramatically more complicated uh, than we can ever imagine. And unfortunately, because it would be beautiful to know much more about that period that we know was uh, an important one. It's just that the sources are the ones that you can imagine for early medieval times. Uh, and that, uh, however, show us also lots of interesting things. The Middle Ages are beautiful, but um, they must be studied bit by bit. Today we made just some kind of a broader general consideration about this this uh, this thing. So, anyhow, um, for today we stop here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like. Or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.